Hi, I'm Laura McGann, the executive editor of Grid, and this is Bad Takes. I am here with my co-host, Matthew Iglesias. Hey, Matt. Hello. How's it going? It's going all right. Do you got a bad take for us this week? I do. Well, so uh, <clears throat> we have word this week that Ron Klain is going to be stepping down as White House chief of staff and that his successor will be Jeffrey Zients, um, who previously served in the Biden administration as kind of COVID policy coordinator and has done other things in his life. Um, I-, I was reading in Common Dreams that this is a catastrophic decision. Progressives rip choice of Jeff Zients for chief of staff. Um And so this piece revolves together um, a lot of quotes coming from people associated with the Revolving Door Project. Uh, Jeff Hauser, who runs that project, calls it a catastrophic decision. Uh, They quote some of his um, uh, subordinates there have a piece showing that Zions, when he was in the private sector, um, ran an investment company. The investment – he ran several different investment companies at different times – but both of them have invested in companies in the healthcare sector, and some of those companies um, had to settle Medicare fraud claims, and some of them were involved in surprise medical billing. And I guess part of what strikes me as a little odd about this take is just the kind of gap between like the the nuclear strength rhetoric from Hauser. This is a catastrophic decision. They say that he, um, you know, embodies all the corporate malfeasance that Biden should be against. And then you look at the the specific charges, which are that Zients has held several different jobs over the course of his career. Two of those jobs involved management in investment firms. Both of those firms involved some investments in some healthcare companies. Some of those healthcare companies were involved in some misconduct. Some of that misconduct was against the rules at the time and was settled. And some of it, the surprise billing, was not against the rules at the time. And now new rules are in place. And I don't know. Like, I don't want to say it's good to have a company that uh, was involved in a Medicare fraud settlement. But it's also a little off to me. Like, like, what is the concern exactly? Right. So that's the question. So, again, I agree. Not great to have owned a company that settled fraud cases with Medicare. Sure. The question I have with all of this, and it's like you're laying out that it's a, we're bringing a single take here, but that this is a genre of criticism, I'd say, of... Um, Zions himself and, you know, other other public officials, the left's criticism of some other public officials, too, that have a, a past in business. And to me, the question is, is the person who is going to serve in government making decisions in which they have a conflict of interest? You know, so... Uh, is this person going to serve in government in a way that if they make a certain decision, they will profit from it personally? That would be bad. Uh, or someone in their family. You know, we you can look back at, for example, you know, during the Bush years, you look back at uh, officials who had interests in, you know, war companies, <laughs> sort of uh, d- defense contractors. And so we you, you can go back and look at that. And you, there were some of the, you can look at the Trump administration as well. And you see these things where power was used to profit. And I'm not, that is not explicitly said in any of these uh, criticisms. And so I'm not sure, you know, it sounds more like the concern is that he's not progressive enough on these issues because he's been in the private sector. Well, is that is that like but see and that that's what I'm trying to suss out here. So they're not well, saying he's going to enrich himself per se or maybe that's understood but am I am I reading this wrong that it's really about how do you assess somebody's ideology or how do you assess what they're going to do in office based on previous well work. so to to give a you know a, a version of the complaint that I think goes beyond kind of like self-dealing and corruption look you can worry that there is a kind of uh, ideological capture by industries that people work in 
right? So, you know, if you um, spend your day, day after day, for years and years and years uh, working in the oil and gas industry, you may just like very sincerely develop like a commitment to oil and gas industry lobbying positions, right? Sure. And then you come into government and it doesn't need to be necessarily that you're like consciously self-dealing in your policymaking, but maybe you can't look objectively at the energy landscape or a- another thing, right? So, so that's one, right? A, a causal theory would be to say that Jeffrey Zients' experience as an investor in the healthcare sector makes him unduly sympathetic to the kind of predatory instincts of the private sector healthcare industry. Another concern you could have is that there is a kind of um, – uh, a, 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 like a, a buttering up, right? I mean, the the literal name the, Jeff Hauser. He he runs this group. You know, he's a he's a guy with an oppo research background. I would say. You know, he used to do coordinated campaigns for labor unions, etc. Um, the the mission of the revolving door campaign, its stated mission, is to you know watchdog on people going from private industry into the government and then back out to private industry. And the thesis of that is that people go too soft on private industry because they are explicitly or implicitly trying to kind of, you know, lay the groundwork for their their cashing out sort of um, positions. And you know, my be- I've known Jeff Hauser, uh, who, who runs Revolving Door, um, and we've been friendly at times and we've been combative at times. And ultimately, I just disagree with the view that it would be ideal to not have people from an industry background working in a Democratic Party administration. I think it's a strength of the Democratic Party that, unlike the Republicans, they will have an administration that isn't all business people. But I feel like, you know, the idea that it would be better to have an administration that consisted entirely of college professors and lifetime nonprofit sector workers strikes me as wrong. And like the theory that there would be no conflicts of interest involved in that also strikes me as wrong. So then you want to know, like, is there a specific concern, right? Like, do we think that Jeff Zients uh, is going to sabotage implementation of the new surprise medical billing rules? OK, so here's here's where I'm not I, I I'm not sure I I agree with your broader point there to back up. And I think you're saying fundamentally it is better to have a government where uh, public servants you know, especially leader in leadership positions, come from different backgrounds. And it is better to have a mix of people who came from you know, corporate America investing. Maybe they're from, like you're saying, academia. Maybe they're professional politicians. They've always worked in policy. I am not – I think it is hard to gauge whether or not that's true. Um, I just don't know. I mean, I, 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 I think – the question is relevancy to me that are you is your experience relevant to what you're going to do in office, which is on its face being an academic does not necessarily make you fit. I do not personally think it should bar you from serving in public office because you previously worked in business. So I think we agree. It's just that I think that I don't think a matter of principle should be it is a good thing to have a variety of backgrounds. I think that you have to look. I guess I'm just more of a granular person and more practical. And I think that you have to look at the situation and what job needs to get done and find people who would be good at solving that. Or conversely, there are smart people in the world who you should talk to and identify problems that maybe you don't see and bring them in. Well, right. I mean, I I agree with that. But I mean, I just I I think that if that's your view and you're talking about thousands of political appointments across the executive branch, like what that leads you to. And one thing that happens in the journalism industry is that people start out um, 
in journalism because like they're interested in reporting and they're interested in in articles and they wind up in management roles. Mm. It doesn't always work out that well. You and I have both worked our whole careers in the journalism industry. True. And one thing that happens in the journalism industry is that people start out um, in journalism because like they're interested in reporting and they're interested in in articles and they wind up in management roles. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, you're familiar Hi. with this. Um, I'm raising my hand here. It doesn't always work out that well. You know, a lot of times just say it. you, you can say up, I'm bad at my job. No, it's I fine. don't say that you <laughs> are bad at your job, but I no, would I'm say just, that the yes. caliber of management in journalism is often not super high because you you are yes. your sort I mean, of this first is a, cut yes. is these like chaotic like journalism types. And the same is true like in academia, right? Like in a university department. Somebody will be the department chair. Right. And if you know any college professors, nobody's attitude in academia is like, I really hope I make department chair next year. Because like they're college professors. They're not business executives. They don't really like want to be managers. They want to be scholars. They want to read. They want to write. They want to do their research. People in sciences, you know, the research labs get quite complicated. And something that research scientists often complain about is the amount of paperwork and grant management and stuff like that that they end up doing. And one strength that, you know, um, managing a guy who used to be a management consultant or a guy who used to be a managing partner of an investment firm brings to the table in the executive branch is just like management, qua management, right? That's a big part of the job of the chief of staff is to like be in charge of who should go to which meetings and how often should the meetings happen and when should they happen and how should the meetings be run, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And that to me is the kind of thing where it feels reassuring to feel that like activists and elected officials and academics and nonprofit staffers are going to be leavened by a little bit of like boring suits and I think that's just kind of a, a fact of life, um, you know, and then it's like, like, that's what you want. I you think what you're getting at here is very important because you're sort of distinguishing the function, the various functions of being a chief of staff or, or a leader in government, which is that one, you're looking for people who are going to want to advance the agenda of the current White House. And two... You need in in jobs, especially like a chief of staff, you need somebody who's good at running a thing and has experience running things. Like I agree and, with myself about everything. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> not to put you on fire, but like, you know, if, like if we went back in the time machine, you know, you hired me to work for you and you were the managing editor at the time of this thing where we worked. And then in a matter of weeks, you weren't. <laughs> and that's fine because I think that your strength is in – Content. That's what you're really good at. And I think that in, and in terms of thinking about uh, industry and running an enter enterprise, I think you have opinions that are useful and it's helpful to hear them. But y your interest in having a one on one meeting with each member of your team each week and tracking their progress and making sure everyone is deployed and There's all these an emotional steadiness that's required, you know, where you have to take in new information and react to it. But also think about how will your reaction provoke reactions from other – you know, there's, yes, there's, it's there's, more, there's an art. There's not – right. Uh, and part of what I like about being a manager of journalists is that for me, I see it as an opportunity to have more impact, that I work with lots of people – and get to help them be really good at their jobs and um, make their work better. And I, I like doing my own work. I like being a reporter. I like being a writer. But um, I've just discovered in my career that it's not that I'm maybe better at being a manager than as a reporter writer, but that I'm pretty good at being a manager. And I, I, I like it for the most part. And I like uh, taking disparate pieces, disparate people, and building a team and making the, the pieces add up to more. That I, I've always enjoyed that, of working in smaller places, working with teams, building teams, and seeing, wow, if you bring together 
this many people, it's, it's, it's more than any of those individual people would have made on their own. And so I really like that. And I've been doing that for the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years. But I, you, what you're pointing out in journalism, and it is true in other fields, is that it's sort of seen as climbing the ladder is sort of seen as, okay, you're going to advance in your career into a management role. Or just simply you have somebody in the newsroom who's just a good reporter, good writer, and they are good at making stories better, and they're not uh, so eccentric as (laughs) to be unable to work with lots of different types of people, that they end up in these roles that they're just not interested in or suited for or trained to do, that there's not you know, there's just not a lot of investment in good management. And I don't think that that's totally unique to journalism. Um, I've heard lawyers complain about this, too, of really good lawyers who then have to run teams of lawyers. And it's just like yeah, because not- legally, like a law firm has to be owned by lawyers. That's why that's why law firms have partners. Right. There can't you're, you're not allowed to have like Lawyers Inc., which is run by businessmen and then they employ lawyers. Right. The lawyers have to employ themselves and, and so you and you get to be yes. partner by doing a good job at lawyering. Yeah, being a good lawyer and bringing in clients because you're a good lawyer and then, you know, you're not necessarily great at management or even running things. And Zions is somebody who has experience running things. I think it's worth running down his career though right which is so he he worked he worked at Bain I think um, and then he came to the DC area to work at um, advisory board right. which is a smaller management consulting company but, but it's based in the DC and area. I think it's worth talking about so the advisory committee it's different than other types of consulting firms that the concept I think it was David Bradley who founded it right mm-hmm. and he um, went on to own the Washington Post and no the no? Atlantic oh excuse me I'm so sorry the Atlantic magazine uh, so what advisory board did that was unusual in the consulting field is what they did is they get uh, they 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 identified that okay each company is off on their own solving problems but every company has this th- there's no problem that hasn't already been <laughs> solved by and large and so they bring together you know they have these members and that they surveyed members and got information from executives and then by sharing pooling this information keeping it sort of anonymous but, but feedback by industry you could make your company more efficient and i mean you're rolling your eyes maybe that's <laughs> true maybe it's not but there is I mean, I guess I sort of feel that way. I tend to lean towards this is useful to hear what other companies have done and learn from what they did because yes. I find that useful. You are shaking your I'm just, head. I'm just rolling I'm my eyes saying, at David Bradley because oh, I, I work okay. for him We're briefly. still on David Bradley. Just, <laughs> anyway, right. fast so, forward. So the Zines point is, an advisory is board guy. he is a guy. And the whole point of this is to say, okay, Here's how we solve problems more efficiently. Rather than starting every day from zero or your company starting from zero, you rely on the wisdom of other companies and people who have dealt with this before. And to me, as a manager, I find that useful to hear how problems have been dealt with before. Even though I'm in new media, a lot of the a lot of running an enterprise is just it's it's not it's not unique um, the problems that we encounter. And I if you look at some of the ongoing criticism of Zions. It's that he has an approach, I I would say a similar approach to this. So he was criticized. I I, I really enjoyed going back in time and looking up, do you remember Cash for Clunkers? Yeah. And then Barack Obama becomes president. And so Obama is like trying to make a splash in Washington, whatever. So one of his ideas is he brings this consultant on to be chief performance officer of the United States. Um, His formal title is he he was deputy director of OMB as like an official government job. but, But Obama called him the chief performance officer of the United States as a new thing. The idea being that he was going to bring management consulting know how, you know, that kind of thing to the public sector. He does that. Um. 
basically all throughout uh, Obama's first term with a couple stints as acting OMB director because he was the deputy. Uh, then in the, he, he leaves the administration um, for a little bit, but he comes back really rapidly to sort of do the emergency fix it of the Obamacare website right. after that kind of fiasco. Um, and then he becomes director of the National Economic Council, which is a high-level job. And he serves in that role for the final two and a half years or so of Obama's White House. Um, then he's back in the private sector um, doing investment management stuff, which is where the revolving door people get sort of maddest at him. And then he came back as COVID response coordinator uh, at the beginning of the Biden administration. Now, he's not a, a public health expert, obviously. Um, the conception of this, I mean, if people try to remember what was happening in the winter of 2020, 2021, I think the way the Biden White House thought about this was that vaccination was going to end the pandemic, but that vaccine distribution was all messed up. Because Trump had been spending his lame duck period plotting a coup instead of trying to organize vaccine distribution. And Zients was the management consultant guy, the chief performance officer guy, the fix the Obamacare website guy. Right. And so they tapped him for that. And I think that a lot of people have a lot of different complaints about COVID policy under the first 12 to 24 months of the Biden administration. But the thing that Zions was supposed to solve, right? The getting of the vaccine distribution logistics fixed. He did that. The problem then became a whole other set of questions in which, which is just like weren't logistical questions. And this is sort of, I think the valid question to ask about Zions is, does he know enough about politics to like be White House chief of staff? But his whole deal as a person in Democratic Party politics has been the inject some management expertise into the government. And I just feel like he's done well at that. Right. Uh, the I saw this criticism in a, a piece today that I was looking at in the American Prospective. He was put in charge of COVID-19 response, but he's not a public health expert and that doesn't that's sort of the point that we were talking about that people who are doctors and scientists and public health experts are not necessarily people who've worked on um logistics problems that require an understanding of global trade and uh you know uh working with pharmacies and others to get stuff sent out across the country. And and those types of supply chain and logistics questions are are things that happen in private sector and it needs a it needs a diff- it needs somebody to manage that process. And it sort of doesn't to me matter whether the logistics is getting vaccines out across the country or something else per se. That it it requires an understanding of how to run a project like that, not necessarily an understanding of how viruses work. Right. Now, I mean, but I, I, I guess this is all like long-winded <laughs> preamble to, I feel like the real objection in that prospect article to Zines' tenure as um, COVID response coordinator is that the Biden administration's COVID policies were not as left-wing as the American prospect wishes they yes. had been. Yes. My critique of Zions' tenure as a COVID response coordinator is that the Biden administration's COVID policies were more left-wing than I think they should have been, um, which is sort of fine. But I, I just I almost wish that we could discuss this question more squarely because the the other thing that like really bugged me about American Prospect Revolving Door Project coverage of this science pick for chief of staff is that most of the formal objections you could register to him also applied to Ron Klain, who spent the Trump administration years as a partner at Revolution Capital, which is a venture capital company in Washington, D.C., which invests in a lot of companies. I think most of the companies Revolution Capital invests in are totally fine. Um, But like one of them is like some weird crypto thing. You you know, it's like this is what this is what happens. Now, progressives like Klain 
because they like Ron Klain. Right. You know what I mean? Not because Ron Klain never had a second degree relationship to a business that did something that progressives don't agree with. But one of the things that Klain really put effort into uh, in Obama's second term, during Trump's term, throughout the Biden presidency, is gaining credibility uh, with the base of the party. And he was good at that. Like, it's a, it's a politics job. He did a good job of getting the base on board with him, with Biden, with the agenda. And it's reasonable for progressives to feel like they will not have the same kind of access to Jeffrey Zients, that they maybe don't agree with him about questions of public policy, which would be a more like reasonable way to have an argument than this idea that, you know, some of the companies in his portfolio did a thing because it's like it's like who ca- it's they themselves don't really care. I think Klein is a good example because say Zients was just in line with their views. I don't think his his uh, revolving door question would be quite as front and center, for sure. I think, anyway, I think that the Ron Klain example is good. And the thing with the Prospect article as well is, like you said about the left-wing, more conservative approach to COVID-19, there was a bit about mask wearing. And the issue there is the Biden administration made a decision about mask mandating and what they were going to call for. And that's really not anything to do with science, as far as I understand. And maybe if there were somebody else in that role, you could argue maybe that that there would have been more influence uh, by somebody with a different view. And certainly sympathetically, I would say, yeah, you, you want your person, you want as many people who have you, represent your point of view at the table. And the chief of staff spends a lot of time with the president. And yeah, you want your person with your views. But that's not the same as this person can't do the job or this person had some other issue in their company. It's about pol- like their politics and their points of view, not whether or not they are going to secretly enrich themselves from decisions about health care. You know, I I think it's important to to look at the COVID piece of this because this is is what science was doing in the Biden administration, and if you just want to evaluate it politically, right? What I see is that on basically every front of the sort of COVID battle, the Biden administration was positioning itself to the left of the constraints in the system. Right. Like the Biden administration has lost a number of cases in federal court about covid uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. There have been a number of instances where Democratic Party governors have relaxed mask mandates before the federal government relaxed mask mandates. Right. And it's never been the opposite. Right. There was no state, Republican run state, that kept mask mandates on longer than the FAA did. There are a bunch of Democratic run states that dropped mask mandates before the Department of Transportation did. So you can not agree with that outcome if, if you want. But if you're just trying to evaluate sort of like who are the players, where are they, there was no time at which the Biden administration was like driving COVID policy to the right. You know, and I and I understand that people with like very hawkish views on COVID are frustrated that their views didn't prevail uh, in, in the United States of America. But as the country moved to normalize over the course of 2021, 2022, The Biden administration was always normalizing more slowly, like not just more slowly than Florida or Texas, but more slowly than the government of the District of Columbia, more slowly than the state government of Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or or Michigan. And to this day, I mean, one of the only offices that I have seen a substantial fraction of people wearing masks in over the past several months is the executive office of the president. 
You know, like it is in just in fact like a more COVID hawkish group of people than the average American there. And that's different from a situation like, um, you know, where, where you feel there's like some kind of like internal sabotage, right? And there like could have been huge progressive policy wins, but the White House decided not to do it. I can't think of any examples of that really. It's not that the Biden administration has been super left wing, but they've had this like really small congressional majority. And everything that's ever happened under Biden has been Biden trying for more than, you know, is available from Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema, And so to an extent, I just almost feel like it's like factional politics on autopilot. Like people people like to fight. Well, there's also it's it's always marginal, right? So, OK, the Biden administration was not at the they, they were following the trend, right? Like they, they've stayed further to the left than uh, where the country was headed. And the argument would be if you had somebody who's pushing Biden to stake out something even further left, that then when you move, you're not moving as far to the right. Federal mask mandates went away because they lost in court. Like vaccine mandate for the U.S. military is just going to end because it was required to get Republican votes for the National Defense Authorization Act. It seems like an argument about nothing. Well, in terms of who you want, going forward as chief of staff and you look at what this person's portfolio is going to look like, Mm -hmm. mask mandates are sort of, are you going to mandate or not, right? Like there's a, there's a zero, you know, one or the other. And that's different than most policy areas, which are less yes, no. So if you're thinking about it that way and you've got somebody who's the gatekeeper to the president making decisions about how much time people get with him and which views get more time than others, then I do see that argument that you would rather have maybe Ron Klain in that role, putting you and your your faction forward, because that's the role he's been playing, than maybe somebody else who you're not convinced is as sympathetic to you. You know, if I think about the Obama administration, right, I feel like progressives were generally happier with the economic policies of, like, late Obama than with early Obama, Um, which is to say, like, when Zions was running the National Economic Council, that was the same time that Obama, like, stopped his efforts to get a deal on um, cutting Social Security and Medicare, for example. Now, on the other hand, Zients was NEC director while Obama was making a hard push for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right? So you might say, well, you know, under Biden, we've really sort of moved away from Clinton-Obama approach to trade. And I'm concerned that Zients is going to lead to some kind of backsliding on that. And... I don't think I would like agree with that on the merits, but that is a real like difference of opinion that you could hang something on, Um, you know, or you might say, I I, I don't know what. But, you know, there are things that people disagree about in politics, maybe because of corrupt or nefarious motives, but I think also just because it's not like super obvious just like positions don't command universal consensus and you want people who agree with you in the government rather than people who disagree with you. Um, But that requires some discussion of like, what are the people's involved actual opinions about things? Um, And the fact is, in a lot of these cases, I think we just don't know. I mean, Zions has been, you know, a fairly important person in Washington for a while now. And my assessment as a journalist, as a reporter, uh, is that I don't actually know that much about what he thinks. When you are in politics, you want to trust the people in power to do the things that you want. And so when you look at Ron Klain, you see, OK, I, I see his the overall thrust of his career. I've seen the decisions he's made. I've seen the role he's been playing recently. And then you have a guy like Science who he's got a corporate background. You know, he's a he's a he's a business guy. And we don't know 
what his views are on everything. And the thing with being in the White House is things come up. You know, we we can look specifically at what his portfolio might look like tomorrow. But we didn't know that uh, Trump was going to have to deal with a a deadly outbreak of a an incurable virus. So you vote for somebody thinking, whatever happens, I trust that this person is going to represent my point of view. And so when you've got this person whose background doesn't fit what you want, and there's a lot of unknowns, you are going to say, okay, well, this is his point of view on the world. And so I'm going to apply that, generally speaking. And I think it's okay and fair to say, well, I don't have a list of five policy areas right now where I'm concerned, you can have a generalized concern about where things might go. Right. And and I mean, but I do think that this goes back to the sort of big picture question of like, is it good or is it bad to have people with business backgrounds in the administration? Because I think that that's fundamentally what this comes down to, right? That there's a lot of known unknowns, as you were saying, about like what topics will come up in the future. Uh, but something that we know is that all the time in politics – Something happens, something becomes salient, some decisions need to be made, and business executives are saying, you got to do this, Mr. President, right? Like business interests lobby the government over different topics. And I think progressives believe that Zions is a business person who knows other business people and is more likely than someone else to agree with them about who's to say, right? Just like hypothetical dispute X. That one of the things, one of the roles he played in Obama's second term was that there were very few people with business backgrounds working in the Obama administration. And sometimes the White House would like need someone to talk to some CEOs and try to make them feel better about things. And Zions was often the guy who was dispatched to do that. Right. And then the question is, is like, well, is Zions Obama's ambassador to the CEO class or is he the CEO classes like in sure. to the Obama administration? I guess this is, you know, I mean, this is my uh, cranky uh, right wing view. But like I just like I don't worry at this point that a Democratic Party administration is going to end up having too many people who understand business and the business world in it. And some of that is like thanks to the efforts of people like the Revolving Door Project who have cut down on that kind of thing. But I just like don't share the vision that the ideal would be um, to be like hermetically closed off from the business world because I think that, you know, frankly, a, a team that consisted exclusively of activists and academics uh, would really run the risk of like not knowing what they're talking about on a lot of important subjects. What I agree with you on is that there is a certain level of expertise in one management, two, uh, two expertise in sort of that constituency and thinking about how to manage that constituency, and then another point in terms of um, how we're framing this conversation is that. There is this idea that somebody coming in from corporate America has a, a frame of view of the world and will be influenced by that in a way that is not good because, you know, anyway, we, we've sort of established that. But it assumes that somebody, say, who works for a nonprofit and is an activist doesn't have pressures themselves. And I don't think that's true. That, and you know, you're under a lot of pressure as an activist to keep your issue front and center, to raise money, um, and the type of money that you raise uh, comes from different types of people, and so you have your own set of interests. So for when you leave government, if you want to go back to that space, you don't want to say, "Well, I solved all that." And now I'm back here at my nonprofit and I don't, you know, don't give us any money because 
we're we're fine. We fixed everything. I am skeptical of institutions in general, and so I think there's a there's this assumption of you say nonprofit or a university. That these are these are good institutions, right? Like they that the left's view is there are bad institutions like banks and companies, and then there are good institutions like universities and nonprofits. And the reality is that I just I guess I'm a cynical person, but anytime you set up any kind of institution, there can be problems and things go wrong. And and we've seen it. You see it all the time. We've seen it at universities. We've seen it in nonprofits where things um, are not, you know, you can have a mission that you agree with on the merits, right? That you can say, you know, I agree with whatever, whatever the mission of the organization is, but the organization itself is not necessarily good. Well, and look, I I mean, an obvious example of this, right, is the Biden administration has been messing around quite a lot with student loan rules, right? Right. And this has been, I I mean, there's a lot of different moving pieces to it. Um, But however you come down on this policy, right, it would be really naive to think that, well, you know, because um, whether it's, you know, uh, Michigan State or uh, Wesleyan or whatever else, that because the institutional actors in American higher education are nonprofit or public sector entities, that like they don't have financial interests at stake in this Decision making, right. or that there's no sort of possibility um, of a kind of a corrupting influence there, and so it's like, you know, I I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, what I would really not want to see is somebody brought in as chief of staff who had no experience with the public sector, right? Like I I do not think it would be a good idea to say like, well, this is really a management job, so we need like some investor guy to just come right in, right? And what I think is, you know, good about Zions is that he came in at the deputy OMB director level, and then he was the OMB director, and then he was the NEC director, and then he had a special kind of czar post in the White House. And that is the kind of experience that I think you want to see in a chief of staff, which is to say he's worked in the executive office of the president, in a number of different roles and has a good sense of what happens in the executive office of the president and how you relate to the other people who work in that office and how the people who work in that office relate to other stakeholders in the universe. Um, Now, of course, some people serve at high levels of government and do a bad job and who don't want to see them promoted. Um, But the consistent theme in his public sector career is that first Barack Obama and then second Joe Biden, who of course was himself in the Obama administration, thought Zions was doing a good job. So that all just, you know, from 10,000 feet seems really good and important to me. What I feel like is still a kind of known unknown about this, though, is like, like what like what happened in the White House COVID task force? I was surprised when this pick was announced just because I feel like I feel like that was the part of Biden's presidency that it is hardest to say this just like went really well and people were pleasantly surprised. This is why in terms of a a mark on or ding on Zions is, OK, you can look at it narrowly of, well, what was his role in, in vaccine rollout uh, and logistics? Fair enough. But. And and you can also say there's a left view and a right view on COVID response. But my question at the time and still with the Biden response to COVID was it didn't it seem kind of muddled. It wasn't well. It did not seem to me that it was well thought through. And, you know, we kind of saw that with Omicron. It just seemed like the White House was caught flat footed with a very predictable situation on the horizon. We're now thinking about, okay, well, what about preparing for the next um, outbreak? Um, and so, you know, we're next, excuse me, next pandemic. So anyway, there, there's like, we could have a whole conversation about the merits of the, you know, or, or, or sort of ha- assessing how well the White House responded to COVID. Fair enough. And to what extent science 
drove that bigger picture policy versus implementing certain pieces of it is a little opaque to me. I don't think we can fully know that. If your view is all things being equal, it's just really the most important thing is to staff the White House with people who you can trust to share your ideological view, if that is your priority, well then, yeah, Zions is kind of a little bit of a wild card there. The the part of this that gives me a little bit of pause that, you know, I, I think was not in the take was just when I talk to people in the Biden White House, on the vast majority of subjects, they have a kind of a strong line. Right. You know, on the economy, they say, like, inflation is heading down. We have record low unemployment. They are proud of this record. They recognize some problems, but they're proud of the record. They, they help moderate gas prices. I'm saying that they took a lot of criticism for, like Afghanistan. Like, they say they made the right call, and they have an explanation for that. You talk about Ukraine. They think they've done a very good job on Ukraine, right, that they are leading a Western effort to tackle that. China, bam, you know, they've got, they've got these lines, and they talk very proudly about their legislative record. You know, well, they will say, look, like people didn't think we'd be able to get anything done with these super narrow majorities in Congress. But we've got a couple big pieces of partisan legislation and we've got a bunch of important bipartisan legislation done. They hold their heads high. COVID, they're not like, oh, my God, we fucked everything up. But that is the one topic where they move into, you know, um, excuse making mode. Where they're like, look, it wasn't our fault that like Delta and Omicron evolved. We were dealt a bad hand, right? And that's what happens. Like no administration is ever like so successful that they can claim to have triumphed on every front. But that is, I feel like, the Biden White House's weak point where they even now are not like 100 percent sure what it is they want to say about their own policies other than that things became very difficult due to the evolution of the virus itself. So I was just a little bit surprised that they would choose to kind of lampshade this. I think that they've benefited politically from people just like caring less about COVID over time because they never quite had a a message like whose side are they on what are they trying to do i mean i also just thought it was kind of messy like the 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 funding question mark was there why are we why did they not allocate more funds in terms of in terms of getting vaccination out there it there was i just thought it was odd like an odd decision if you want lots of people vaccinated you'd want to continue Continue to invest in these sort of community centers and stuff that seem to be fairly effective at getting people vaccinated. And so I just wasn't sure what they were doing. I mean, I think there's ideological approaches. And then there's just this sort of, okay, we have some evidence here of what worked and what didn't. And it it, it seemed like the, the administration sort of looked away, that they deprioritized that and were focused on other agenda items and kind of let COVID fall by the wayside is my impression of what happened there. And, you know, there were political reasons to do that. But I, I, I just thought from a policy standpoint, it seemed muddled. I was confused about what they're doing. I was surprised by the ongoing response to it of of the kind of longer term, you know, if you if you want to address this, you gotta you gotta keep beating the drum to get people uh, not only vaccinated but boosted, and and that really fell by the wayside. And there was real evidence of that of the effects of pulling back on that. If you look at um, there was a poll that came out about uh, the uh, most recent round of boosters, and and, and Americans didn't even know. In terms of getting the word out nationally, you got to you got to you really need a federal push to be able to do it. And you got to have money to do it. And we know what was effective in the past. So yanking that money just seemed like a strange choice. See, I I don't really agree with that on the part. I mean, I just think the evidence is that the overwhelming majority of people don't care about COVID at all. And there's like a tiny number of liberals who are disproportionately concentrated in the media and continue to be sort of hung up on this. Um, I just disagree with the wanting versus not wanting. Like, You can't say they want versus not want if you don't know that something exists. 
How do you say I I don't want a booster and then you don't know that there is a booster? I think if you think of the COVID coordinator job as like the management part, it seems fine. But if you think of it as a messaging job, right, where you're you're coordinating like what do people hear about COVID, right? That that was not that well done. Correct. Both on the level of are people hearing I about agree. boosters, but also just like are the different cabinet secretaries like saying similar things? Right. Or it like was, yes. are we trying to tell people to be more worried about COVID or less worried about COVID? Right. And this is where I I wonder because the original idea of bringing Jeff Zients into the government way back at the beginning of Obama's term was really, really, really to do the behind the scenes, right? Chief Performance Officer of the United States. This is like explicitly the parts of running the government that like people don't hear about and people don't care about. And to just be like, look, we want to quietly make the trains run on time a little bit better. So, like, fine. But a big part of politics, like, is you can't take the politics out of politics, right? And I I just, like, I, I wonder. Like, this is one of the main things that the chief of staff has to do is, like, get everyone to— Yes, everyone on the same page. To be like, this yes. is what we're doing. Discipline, yes. And everybody has to at least, like, agree with us or disagree with us. Like, understand what we're saying about this. And— I don't know how the COVID response was like structured in that regard, but it didn't work. Sure. And I don't know whether or not that's Zeint's problem or not. But certainly if I'm sitting here going, yeah, what, what was that about? You know, I didn't I was like not sure. And it, it just felt very muddled to me when I the word that comes to mind is muddled. And so if we're looking for somebody who's going to be chief of staff who is keeping the trains running and keeping everybody in step and keeping everybody on the same page. You know, I don't I don't know. So that so then you're in this position of, all right, well, you can look back at Zions and, you know, he he swooped in to fix the Obamacare website. He's done other things. But the most recent thing with the COVID-19 response was just that I would not call that a shining moment in the Biden administration. So therefore, you kind of wonder about him um, from a job perspective. And then you if you're on the left, you're looking at this going, well, I didn't even like where the Obama or excuse me, the Biden administration stood. So so I can see it. One thought I had about this, too, is that getting back to institutions, there is a thing called the revolving door project. And so you're going to look at it that way You know, when your job is to assess <laughs> revolving door issues and you've got this person who's coming in who clearly has revolved, you're going to write a story about that because that's your mandate as a group. And so the extent to which we are sitting here talking about why is this conversation around who is the revolving door instead of a deep dive into what went wrong with COVID is that the forces driving the anti-science position, you know, this is going to I don't want to I don't want to make anybody sound super shady, but it's like you are paid to push conversations around the revolving door. You're, you're not going to say, you know, I know our mission as an organization is to foster conversation around revolving door and pressure liberals not to do that. Anyway, so, so I, I want to clarify but, my position as a take evaluator, yeah. which is that I am not saying, for exactly the reason you outline, I'm not saying that the revolving door project people per se are doing a bad take to be so focused on the revolving door issue. I'm blaming the common dreams and American prospect people for so directly channeling this particular. Well, you also look at the American prospect, and look, I again, I didn't ki- look ki- super kind of specifically, case, you know, but they they ran a Jeff Hauser. Peace. Like they but, seem to yeah. have some partnership with this group. Yes, but, but, so they're, but, they're yeah. like, OK, the 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 ecosystem here is there's a group that this is their job and they they push this. And then the American Prospect, which is a sort of uh, launch pad for liberal ideas, yeah. you shall say, 
has a partnership with them. And so Jeff Hauser comes and says, I have this piece that I wrote. And American Prospects says, well, we like content and we have this partnership with you. So we're going to publish this. And OK, sure. That's a that, I understand. I've done partnerships over the years with you know newsrooms and ProPublica or newsrooms at Ki- the Kaiser Family Foundation. This just puts you in this position of pushing a narrative, which uh, these types of publications is what they do. They, they, they want to have impact in the conversation. And so you're taking a take that is framed a certain way and pushing that out. And as an editor, I was looking at this piece and there were bits of it that were interesting to me. And it's just not how I would have framed the story. It's just not what I would have leaned into as a conversation about whether or not this is the the person that the left should be excited about. So, look, I have some doubts about the Zion's pick on the merits. I have some understanding of why progressive minded people may have some doubts about him. I also do think as a journalist who wants people to be well informed and who thinks that even mission driven publications should be trying to inform their audiences, not propagandize them. To me, the lack of contrast between Klein and Zions on the specific question of did they used to be partners in venture capital groups um, is really important, right? In terms of like what is driving dissent about this? Like what is this about? What are people angry about? Um, it, It seems like I don't know, like actually misleading to me and also just like overconfident. You know, like I wish that I could sit here and tell you, like, here's exactly what Jeffrey Zients thinks about every controversial issue in the universe. But part of my, you know, responsibility as a take offerer is just to say that, like, you know, this is a guy who's been kicking around uh, high level American politics for a long time. Um, and We don't know that much about his views, you know, and we're kind of going to have to see what happens. Um, so I, I like I, I sympathize. I have also at times received the assignment to come up with a take on something in the absence of really clear information. But like, I just like, I don't think three jobs ago, the guy had a company that invested in a company that did a thing and that thing was bad. It's just like not strong evidence. Yeah. You know, there might be reasons you do it, right? Like I've been making fun of Ron DeSantis as a uh, short stature and his weird posing in pictures. Um, but that's just because I don't agree with him about Medicaid. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I'm just like needling somebody I disagree with. Yeah. You wouldn't needle. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. I <laughs> Great. Um I think that's a good example. I, I, I think that it is useful, though, for people to understand what forces could be at play that might push this kind of idea and why this push uh, has gotten more play than others. So I think it's useful. Um, it also makes me think we should check out Jeff Science and look back at what, what was up with Biden's COVID-19 response. I have some reporters work for me. <laughs> well, I, them, might, uh, them. I might uh, look into this matter. Uh, and I'm just kind of curious, you know, how did, how did that all, how'd that go? What happened? Yeah, all what right. happened to that? Should okay. we wrap it up? Yeah, I think we can wrap it up there. All right. This has been another episode of Bad Takes from Grid, uh, produced by District Productive. And we'll be back next week with more Bad Takes. Bad Takes.